Well, good morning to you. I thought what I'd do is go through a number of the items that are on our council agenda for the week, uh, particularly tomorrow, starting with our resolution to approve the tax supported fiscal plan summary for FY 13 to 18. And the reason starting there is because it is a sobering report. It is, of course, a snapshot in time. But what it suggests is that if we are, as we must, meet our maintenance of effort obligation next year, that we are looking at the potential of a 5% reduction in our budget for county government. Again, a snapshot in time. We had similar projections last year, but those projections were based on the um, energy tax going away. And so when the energy tax continued, that gave us more revenue. We were something on the order of $250 million in the whole last year and over 130 from the energy tax. So there were ways to make it up. Now our projections assume continuation of the energy tax. And so going forward, it is going to be harder to maintain the quality of services that our community expects. So even at a time when many of us are hopeful that the economy is turning around and um, it suggests that we are going to have to continue to be vigilant in our fiscal management and that we are going to have some hard choices going forward. Now, of course, if the economy does pick up and income tax revenues increase and property values rebound, um, that will be uh, a nice development. But at this moment in time, we obviously can't uh, assume that to be the case. This will not be my principal responsibility next year. I, I, fortunately, that'll be the responsibility of the next council president uh, in terms of the budget. But I, I do want to foreshadow, if you will, that we have difficult times ahead. Um, so important to understand. We will have a briefing tomorrow on our Shaping Our Future, Adapting to Change series, this time focusing on our human services delivery systems. How are we doing in light of the change in demographics in our community? What new services are we providing? Are, we, are our citizens getting access to all the services that they're entitled to? Uh, there's one report, for example, that shows that in the state of Maryland, uh, we rank 38th in access to food stamps. Okay. What's getting in our way of ensuring that our public <clears throat> takes advantage of the services that are available to them to make sure that in these difficult economic times, our safety net is as strong as it should be. So a part of the purpose of these briefings is to bring in national experts, and you'll see that again uh, tomorrow, bringing in national experts on human service delivery models, and then having our director, who is wonderful, respond to what she's heard as well as brief us on the things that she's doing. And we are fortunate that we're doing a lot and doing it well. But given the dramatic shifts in our population and the dramatic impact of this recession, it's important to know are we making the kinds of changes we need to and what kind of changes going forward will we have to address. There's an action item uh, on tomorrow's agenda that uh, joint committees will be taking up today on energy efficiency. And it's a, a significant issue, a significant matter. Um, the national building codes have been updated to provide for a 30% increase in energy efficiency. Uh, Maryland is the first state, I believe, in the country to adopt those codes, and our county will be among the first counties in the state to adopt the state's model. We have very little discretion in this regard, but the builders are not particularly happy because they would have preferred to have in the building envelope has been increased. 
So there are two ways, basically, in which you can achieve energy efficiency. You can tighten the building itself, or you can have high efficiency equipment. In the past, there was, you were allowed to trade off the one for the other. One of the big advances that was made in this last, last uh, change was that, no, you can't make trade-offs. You have to ensure that the envelope itself is tight, and then you can have um, high efficiency equipment as well. But you can't have a trade-off. The builders came in and asked us to allow that in our code, and we basically aren't allowed to do anything that would weaken the state standards, and our building code officials made it clear that from their perspective, that's exactly what would happen if you did this trade-off between the building envelope and energy efficiency. And so we will, I believe, be approving these regulations tomorrow, and uh, it's, they've asked for a little additional time to adapt to the change, and we are granting them that. But basically, it means that our homes going forward will be 30% more efficient, uh, which I think is good news for our community. We have a zoning text amendment that's coming out of the Fed Committee with respect to transit proximity, and it relates to the Mark Station in Kensington. Uh, some of you may recall that um, we do provide for, um, if you will, a benefit to the development community by developing near transit. The issue, of course, is what does Mark do for transit? And uh, the Mark Station literally provides, I think, something on the order of 100 uh, round trips for residents, far short of what uh, Metro provides. And so there was a strong belief that we need to recalibrate how much credit, if any, to provide for a Mark Station in the context of what we pro allow builders to get credit for. Um, and so the bill coming out of committee basically eliminates the credit for mark stations. There is some conversations about going to some modest uh, number. I believe there were two members of the uh, planning board that suggested uh, a slight credit. Uh, and so people are looking at that, and I don't know what the outcome of that will be tomorrow. But I highlight that this is a tweaking of our um, approval of the Kensington Master Plan and the CR zone generally to make sure that if we're giving credit, we're doing it for transit that provides meaningful transit options. And finally, there's a notice with respect to this little tree bill. Who had that tree bill? That, that uh, confirms what I had shared with you previously, that uh, uh, I am revisiting the legislation to make sure that we provide the kinds of protections that our community is seeking, but does so in a legal framework that's consistent with our authority and does not directly regulate public utilities. I have with me, if you are interested, a uh, email that I got, uh, I think, uh, on Wednesday in which uh, just bemoaned what happened to her uh, community and the trees in her community because sometimes you guys wonder, well, what, what is this all about? And so these are the kinds of emails we get every day on, from people that are just asking, why are they allowed to do this? They have just really changed our neighborhood so dramatically and it seems so unnecessary. So I have uh, some copies for you if you're interested in that. Folks, I'll open it up to you guys. I will start with a report this afternoon, the six-year plan. Uh, does this mean the energy tax? When is that supposed? Was that supposed to sunset again when you passed it again? Actually, what we did this past budget is we reduced the increase in the energy tax by 10 percent. So we made a 10 percent reduction, um, and we said that we hope to be able to make comparable downward adjustments going forward. We couldn't and chose not to make a specific commitment because we were afraid of not being able to meet our commitment and we concluded that it was far worse to make a commitment that you can't keep uh, as opposed to keep trying to 
dig away at this. So I know that my colleagues and I continue to hope that we will be in a position to decrease that tax, and this just underscores it's, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, how, is it possible that it's going to stay that way for, um, for the foreseeable future with a plan coming? It doesn't seem like you have to find money somewhere else if you get, got rid of it, right? Yes. You have to find money someplace else. You have to have a balanced budget. So you either have to find money someplace else or you have to make cuts. So, yes, it is possible. You will see, for example, in, in the fiscal plan uh, that our contribution to OPEB, our pension obligations, also goes up dramatically. And this year it went up dramatically, but not, we didn't go as far as the fiscal plan otherwise called upon us. We are putting ourselves on a very good trajectory with respect to meeting OPEB, but you have to keep balancing that versus your other demands. So I, for one, have always felt that as long as we continue to make strides that are really significant, that that's the most important piece as to whether or not it's exactly what the fiscal plan called for, which was an eight-year uh, total payment into. Uh, I think we have some flexibility there, but again, that will be something that future council will look at. So just to clarify, you, you, when you were talking about the fiscal plan, earlier and called it a sobering report, you said that that plan does not incorporate the change you guys implemented? It did. It did. Okay. But what it, the last fiscal plan mm -hmm. assumed that the energy tax was going to sunset, mm -hmm. okay? And so we had a $250 million gap in our last fiscal plan, of which 130 was represented by the decision to continue with the energy tax. This time, we're assuming the energy tax is going to stay, and we still have this dramatic reduction in county funding um, if you assume that we're going to meet, as we will, our maintenance of effort obligation, because it is an obligation. How, how big is the gap that you guys are looking at now? I apologize. I should have that number. I'll just give you the packet because I, I really, I can't. Um, is Mr. Farber here? The packet is online for today's uh, GO committee meeting. I'm, I'm looking it's at a 5.2, it. uh, uh, it was the percentage that jumped out at me as opposed to the number, but it's right here. I apologize, I just don't, I can't find it in this moment. But there's the packet. Okay. Okay. Will current energy tax levels and um, OPEP levels remain as caps, that is to say, is increasing the energy tax again and lowering OPEP payments, are they both still off the table or will you consider Well, our, our fiscal plan assumes again that we will continue the energy tax at the current level mm -hmm. and that we meet what the fiscal plan set forth with respect to OPEP, okay? That's what the fiscal plan has as assumptions. Sure, but I mean, we've, we've broken from that. I mean, so we have broken from that, and we, we will look at it again next year and, and make determinations next year. So it's not off the table, essentially? Well, Raising energy tax or lower Oh, I, I would find it very surprising if we went the other way on energy taxes. Our, our commitment is to reduce energy taxes. So I would think that uh, if you will, worst case scenario is keeping the energy tax at its current level as opposed to further reductions. Mm -hmm. That's just one members. When you say, is anything possible? I've got eight colleagues. And so, you know, anything's always possible, but it doesn't seem to be fruitful to have that kind of conversation. I mean, so if you've broken from that before, how influential is this fiscal plan on the decisions that you make? Well, it, it is influential, and it's influential in terms of creating the budget. So whereas we, quote, have broken from it in the past, we broke from it, if you will, in, in the context of OPEB, and last year we doubled in the budget that we just passed, we doubled our contribution to OPEB. So from my perspective, uh, I think we've demonstrated to the bond rating agencies our fiscal conservative approach. We doubled our uh, OPEB contribution and increased our reserves. But the fiscal plan actually had us going more than doubling 
are. Uh, OPEB. I believe the number in the fiscal plan was something on the order of $130 million for OPEB, and we did $105 million. So it was a little short of what the fiscal plan called for, but was a serious commitment nonetheless. Um, but what is important about the fiscal plan is it sends the signal very early on to our agencies as to the kinds of budget they need to develop because in the absence of them being guided by this, it makes it a lot harder for us to do our work in the case of, in case the fiscal situation doesn't change. How much does the approximately 5.6 percent expansion of the fiscal 13 budget play into this fiscal plan suggestion? Is it a little too soon? I'm sorry. We're going to need Mr. Farber. Uh, you can, you can chat. It was a 5 percent increase. Um, a lot of the increase was associated with OPEB and setting aside the reserves, so the 5 percent was more agencies. And as you'll recall, of that amount, a, the great bulk of it was for adding police. Uh, and that is an ongoing expense, so it's not something that we're going to be able to reduce going forward. Uh, it is a commitment that we've made that we want to ensure public safety in our community. Victor. What regrets, if any, do you have of not going to the charter limit for property taxes, given this information? Well, it was a conversation that we had internally for some period of time, uh, um, because it was, I think, the first time in 12 years that we had not gone to the charter limit. And it took off the table something on the order of $30 million a year forever, because your base now is that much lower. Um, so it was something that we talked about internally. The county executive obviously had proposed a budget that was below the charter limit. And we are always concerned about our competitive posture. We are always concerned about the current economic situation that our, our people are feeling. And so it was one of these trade-offs of not trying to have a property tax level that was not competitive, and secondly, recognizing that our people are still, still struggling. And so when property values are actually decreasing to raise property taxes was something that uh, we collectively looked at each other and said, don't think so, can't go there. But does it have its own set of trade-offs? Absolutely. And it, the reality, of course, is you don't get credit from your constituents for having kept property taxes below the charter limit because all they see is, but it's still going up. And you say, well, it could have gone up more. They go, well, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah you don't get a lot of, so it was, uh, I think, the right thing to do, uh, but it comes at a cost. Can you describe how the decision, uh, MCPS's decision to increase salary uh, plays into this fiscal plan? Well, again, recognize that our obligation going forward is to meet maintenance of effort. And that obligation was fundamentally altered by the state legislature in a way that provides virtually no flexibility, really, to go below maintenance of effort. The concern that we expressed, the county executive and I expressed to the school board, was that by having two raises in one year, they have effectively locked in such a large portion of any increases that get to maintenance of effort that it'll be very difficult to address some of the other classroom-related sets of issues. Well, that's their choice, but it is a choice. And we wanted to make sure they understood that given the new maintenance of effort law, it seemed that they needed to understand they should not assume that we'll be able to exceed maintenance of effort going forward. And so if that is the ceiling, then they have to make choices within that ceiling that balance the need for teachers to get competitive salaries 
and to address the classroom sets of issues like the number of kids in classes, class size, instructional aids, music, art, and a lot of other things that have suffered during this period of time. Um, so again, I apologize. Our fundamental concern was if you allocate this chunk of change, which will eat up a lot going forward, then it leaves you so little to deal with the other sets of issues. And don't come back to us and say, oh, but we want to address those other sets of issues. But to do that, we need to go above maintenance of effort. Mm -hmm. And so we were saying, uh, really, don't assume that. In other words, the salary, uh, salary funding does, is factored in under maintenance of effort. Absolutely. Okay. Um, can I just know that he's walked in. Can I ask the same question? Uh, do you know what the, the gap is in uh, interest rates for fiscal 14? in terms of the, in order, given all these extra obligations you have going forward, um, if you maintain the same level of funding, what would be your fiscal? Mr. Farber, I, I mentioned the 5.2% reduction in county, but I didn't have the dollar number at the top of my head. So do you have what that represents in terms of absolute dollars? Right. Well, let's see. Uh, for uh, the county government, I'm glad to see you paused. <laughs> Makes me feel a little better. Right. Yeah. County government would go down um, by uh, uh, county government would go down. Sorry, say that I have a uh, that's what, the Montana. <coughs> yeah, the 5.2% reduction that would be forced uh, by maintenance of effort alone for the schools, given the fact that uh, the, the non agency uses uh, are going to, if you have my spreadsheet, mm -hmm. uh, which is in the packet on circle three, uh, the non agency uses are going up by 28%. Revenues are going up by 2.3 percent, and what that creates for the four agencies is a minus 1.1 percent. And if from that you increase the schools by one and a half percent, that requires reduction for county government and also park and planning by 5.2 percent. And that translates in dollar terms for county government into uh, 66 million dollars. And then overall. Mm -hmm. Do you have a number encompassing the agencies, or? Yes, um, I can go over this with you. It's right on okay. the spreadsheet here, and it stands out very clearly in the fiscal 14 column on circle three. Okay. What else, gang? Uh, do you have any comment on the uh, Inspector General's report that's coming this afternoon? I do not. I wanted to clarify something on the building code changes. You mentioned homes, but is that other buildings as well? This is about homes. It's just about homes. Okay. Just single family or is this multi-family as well? Single family. You may recall that once upon a time, I, you won't recall, I had, uh, <laughs> I had sponsored legislation which our council adopted that um, required our homes to meet what was then called Energy Star. And uh, we added a provision that said you either have to meet Energy Star, Home, Home Star, or uh, a building code if it was found to be equivalent. Um, the builders came in and urged that we adopt the building code because they said it was equivalent and they shouldn't be subject to a different standard. And since it was equivalent, we were fine with that. But it was also true that we expected that to continue to increase over time, and it has. What was interesting about this is that there's a, always a major fight at the national code setting meeting between the building industry and the energy efficiency world. And this year, the energy efficiency world actually organized and made sure that all of the communities like ours who typically support energy efficiency showed up and we sent the maximum number of people that our county was able to s send to this meeting 
And as a result of that, we actually succeeded for one of the first times in considerably increasing the energy efficiency. Um, and the building industry was taken aback and uh, they're, they're, so they are, uh, they'll, they're gonna organize for 15 mm -hmm. the next time. They, they learned their lesson, if you will. What about tomorrow's OLO report that drops? Do you have any comment on that? I do not. And what's your um, say, what's your personal opinion on the, um, on Mark's uh, ZTA, the one that's being discussed this afternoon and tomorrow, on the transit? My, my personal view is that we should reduce it uh, considerably, if not eliminate it. I'm open to looking at and hear from my colleagues uh, on any amendments that uh, might provide a modest, very modest credit, because it is a very modest transit reality. So I just think that we need to make sure that the credit reflects the reality. Uh, and so if it's a very small amount, uh, I am open to exploring that. What, what's your response to sort of like Kensington's view, Kensington City Hall's view, that, I mean, this, and plenty of sort of people who want to develop in that area, that this is sort of radically changing sort of what, what was sort of approved there and sort of what was already approved by the council a few months ago? I understand that argument. Um, obviously, no one has built yet, so we're not, we are still, if you will, prospective. Um, no one's made commitments that we are changing. Um, and I do think that's an important distinction. And I think we signaled very early on in the Kensington Master Plan, we introduced this legislation prior to approving the Kensington Master Plan, and thereby sent a very strong signal from the get-go that this was something we were going to be re-examining. Um, so, I feel like we are, are doing this the best we can. Would it have been better if we had looked at this in the CR zone? Perhaps when we passed the CR zone initially. Uh, and there were those that, that argued at that time. Um, so sometimes it just takes a little while to, to sort through these sets of issues. Uh, a procedural thing. Do you need the supreme majority here? No. Is, is it, even though it affects the Kensington plan? It doesn't affect the Kensington plan per se. It affects the CR zone. So oh. we're, uh, I think, technically, we're modifying the CR zone, not the Kensington master plan. Uh -huh. um, switching gears a little bit, I want to talk to you about the uh, like what's uh, what's done Lake and with the contaminants that were found in the dredging material. Um, you guys had a public hearing like last week, I think it was. I was wondering how you thought it went. Oh. Uh, did we have a public hearing on it last week? I apologize. I have a terrible memory, but I'm, I'm not aware of the coal. Are, are we talking about the coal tar issue yes. that Council Member Rice introduced? Mm -hmm. I don't believe we've had a public hearing with respect to that. He just introduced the bill last week. Could you tell me a little bit more of your position on that bill? I don't have a position on the bill at this juncture. Okay. Um, so. Were you aware at all of the bill prior to, or, or knew about this? Council, Council Member Rice had shared uh, the legislation with our office, but we just didn't feel like we'd had enough time to really look into the issue. I understand the concerns with respect to it. Clearly, this kind of uh, material is not something that is desirable as to whether or not how to address that is something that the legislation proposes and I'm just, I typically, on something that I'm not personally deeply familiar with, I like to take my time. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not one that typically co-sponsors a lot of other bills unless it's in my wheelhouse, if you'll forgive me, mm -hmm. uh, or something that I've just been in, intimately involved with. So I, I just take my time. This is an environmental matter. I'm chair of the committee and I just wanted to make sure that uh, I approach this in a thoughtful way. I was very surprised that yes, that when it was brought up at the last county council session, it was only for basically three minutes that it was talked about. But I mean, where the material, the dredging material, was supposed to be going onto a baseball field is what I would argue. Well, and I, I was surprised that with you know carcinogens being talked about, almost being dumped on a ball field, it might be talked about a little bit more. 
Well, very rarely do we discuss legislation at introduction. Okay, it's just not what we do. And if it is discussed in introduction, it's generally the sponsor setting forth why the sponsor feels that the bill is necessary and in the public interest. Mm -hmm. um, but you should not take that as a reflection of our council's concern about the issue, or you shouldn't draw any implications. So do you think the council's taking this matter very seriously? Then? I think we are taking this matter seriously. I certainly, I certainly am, and I believe he has four, if not four other sponsors. So there are, if you will, five votes for the measure based on that uh, right now. So I, I think it's fair to quickly, then, I see us, you know, we'll have a committee work session on it. And if the issues are all addressed, then I assume it'll, it'll move to the full council. Okay. The public hearing on that bill is Bill 2112, tentatively set for 1.30 on July 17th. July 17th, okay. So that'll be a public hearing. I don't know when it goes to committee. Don't have that date. Okay, so for may... For some reason, I thought I read that it was last Thursday at 7.30. No, last Thursday at 7.30 was, I believe, Glenstone. Water sewer category. So that there, that was a different kettle of fish. What was the date? If you'll forgive me. Uh, July 17th, 1.30 p.m. Bill Be in the bonnet? Hey, let's get a comment from Miranda. What what's your input on on the Glenstone property? What on this the pub, what happened in the public hearing on Thursday? Well, I think what happened in the public hearing is what you would expect to happen, which is you you hear both sides uh, of the issue, uh, and there are two sides to the issue. Uh, you have one set of recommendations from our planning board and different recommendations from our county executive. Uh, I, I think what is common to all the comments is that this is an extraordinary facility that uh, is a gem for our community uh, as to whether or not the to have sewer versus septic is obviously the narrow set of issues and there are those that are concerned that this establishes a precedent and there are others that look at this and say, actually, sewer might be better than septic. And so if you're not going to have additional development, um, what is better for the environment? Um, so you have development sets of issues. You have environmental sets of issues. You have people that are concerned about precedent. Uh, Where do you fall in that? Do you think that it's worth sort of changing to the system in place? I, I am still waiting our staff's recommendation with respect to that. As you may appreciate, I am the district council member. Mm -hmm. I'm the chair of the committee with jurisdiction over, and I'm president of the council. Mm -hmm. In that context, I've decided that I am going to wait until I've gotten f input from all of the parties, which include our own uh, county staff. Mm -hmm. And then I will decide, we'll have our work session, and then I'll decide. But I did not feel it was appropriate for me to in any way get in front of this. Yet? Do not. We're working with uh, staff today. I worked over the weekend with respect to it. Uh, I did a lot of Google searching uh, for other jurisdictions that have had similar sets of issues, including other state public utility commissions that have had similar sets of issues and trying to balance reliability versus uh, um, the aesthetic values of trees and the importance of trees and the environmental importance of trees. Uh, and there are a wide variety of approaches, uh, some far uh, more radical than what I have suggested. Uh, we had storms roll in last week. How did you think TEPCO did? Did, you, did your office receive any calls? There were thousands of people without power. Dear council members, Hello. I've got another email for you. Okay. How, well, tell me, how did you think TEPCO did last week? I'm not in a position to judge, quite frankly. I need to see uh, a follow-up report. Uh, there were concerns with respect to PEPCO's performance, both in terms of the, the number of outages and their, whether all the communication devices that they have touted were actually working. Some people said that the app wasn't working and things of that nature. Um, but it's, it was over the weekend. I was out of town, and so I really haven't had a full report. And it's really, it's not until you see 
the metrics of what they did and how quickly power was restored, are you in a position to judge really their performance? I did not. I lost, I didn't lose power, I lost uh, internet. Do you have any questions for him? They, they say they're going to talk about um, the storm season and how reliable they are. If, if you were there, would you pose a question to him? Uh, I uh, have posed enough questions to Pepco. Uh, so I, I, I think, uh, no, I, I won't take the invitation. Are you going to today's public hearing? I am not. I had considered it, but I, uh, quite frankly, uh, our county has a formal position in this legis in this rate case, uh, and a very strong position. If you haven't seen our brief, I urge you to look at our county's brief and reply brief in this regulatory proceeding. So I felt it inappropriate for an individual council member to <coughs> speak when our county has done exactly what I asked our county to do, which is to become formal participants before the commission. So to say anything that's different from our formal position seemed to be inappropriate, and to say the same thing seemed redundant. So therefore, uh, I decided that I would not attend. Anything else, gang? Well, thank you very much.